Hello, welcome to episode 121 of the Edge of Futures podcast. Happy New Year, everybody. This is our first one of 21. 121. Do you see what I did there? Ominous that. It's the 2021. It's number one of 21, guys. I mean, you have to explain you're a it that hard. It, it, don't, it, it definitely doesn't work. <laughs> I, don't know. I, thought, I thought it was, when I was writing this, I thought I was quite good. Anyway, we're, we're really um, excited to be and delighted to be joined today by a good friend of the podcast, supporting lots of things that we've done uh, over the years. Uh, Al Kingsley is Managing Director of Net Support Group. Yeah, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast channel, uh, please hit subscribe and check out our back catalogue. Uh, and leave us a review too. Every now and then we just dish out some prizes to people who leave reviews. So uh, leave us one and we might be getting in contact with you. Uh, yeah, go back and watch them as well on youtube.com forward slash edufuturists. So it's our absolute pleasure to welcome Al. How are you doing, Al? Hi there. Thank you. Lovely to be here. And um, rather spooky, really, because 121 is how old I feel at the moment. So uh, it ties in a lot. <laughs> so... The question that people, if we were out to go out and socialise, would be New Year, New You. Any resolutions or any, any anything like that going on in the fitness regime? Are you, are you going to be looking at Joe Wicks on Monday? Or? Um, I might be looking at him, but it will probably be cussing under my breath <laughs> rather than engaging. Um, I, I would love to say um, that was the case. Um, I think there's, there's so many priorities and focus at the moment that um, my, my New Year's resolution is hang in there and keep doing what you're doing now. You know, I do. Um, I know sometimes it can sound a little bit cheesy, but I do remind myself that in the pace of trying to get lots of things done, sometimes you don't always say thank you enough. So I've got that on my little uh, post-it note to remind myself to actually uh, remember at the end of chats with people to, to add that into the mix. Um, and um, hopefully that will last longer than most of my New Year's resolutions um, in previous years. Um, but I think for a lot of us, it's just an endurance race at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think so. Uh, um, and uh, I remember, I, I think I've said a few things on uh, on social media about new tier, new you, which was uh, which was quite interesting. There are obviously different tier system in the UK, but um, we're obviously new year, new you. Um, we're we're into. I think this is this the third year now, Dan. The third year that we've been involved in doing a podcast. Uh, I think so. When was it? Did Steve? Did you join us? Was it two years ago? It will be two years in on Valentine's Day, I think, in terms of the the formal announcement. So, oh, I love this. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So tw- you guys must. Have I love. Been going I love in how, Steve. I love how every year that's what you remember. Not not your partner, <laughs> but that you. This is the anniversary well, of. I'm not being funny, mate. But you need a Valentine's choice. card, so that's why. You know, that's why you have to do it. You know, everybody needs a Valentine's <laughs> card, so that's why I send it to you. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, yours gets lost in my big massive pile of um, the Valentine's cards. <laughs> I'm sure the first show you did, Ben, you were in a, in shorts and a little cap, so it's been quite a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, have, I probably had more hair than I do now. Um, so, yeah, well, yeah. So, um, obviously, your role um, is multifaceted. We'll talk about loads of things today. Um, but one of the things that you are is, or one of your, the hats that you wear is that you chair a trust of two mats, not one, but but two. Um, greedy, maybe, or just a glutton for punishment. Who knows? Um, and 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 obviously, you you've um, the schools that you're involved with. There's there's, there's challenges that people are facing currently. Um, do you want to maybe just talk us through a little bit of that and and what what you're finding as a as, as the chair there and and anything that you're seeing that's there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the for the last twelve years, I've I've been chair of, of a mat in in Peterborough, which is it's nice. It's a nice mix. We've got primary, secondary, and all through provision. Uh, working at my role at the RSC on the head teachers board, sometimes when mats are looking and going through a period of change, they look for people to come in and support that period of change. Uh, so I joined as chair of another mat in in Norfolk. And, and in a similar guise, I'm actually chair of an academy in Peterborough that was the people referral unit. That's transitioned in to join a larger map so i've kind of got i'm going to say that the positive of being involved in schools from um, in in norfolk um alternative provision for children that are all under ehcp with some with very um you know serious physical difficulties and and support that they need and in in the um people referral unit um that school there it's young people who've struggled with mainstream schooling from a behavior and learning perspective Uh, and i think 
one of the, the the sounding boards that really gives us a landscape is we often hear the narrative about what's coming up, what we need to do to try and um, provide provision, particularly during a, a COVID world. And, and, you know, and never more when you look at that cross section of schools, do you say, well, that these policies, one size just doesn't fit all. And, and to suggest that the strategies you might take in a primary school in any way would be similar to one where you've got very vulnerable children or children that really struggle uh, within a, a structured learning environment, you know, and you take young people that have struggled with, with behavior in mainstream setting and, and flip that scenario into um, remote teaching and learning, you know, there's, there's a whole different range of challenges and support and nurture that's required for that. Frankly, just making sure they're safe and, and getting regular contact with them um, becomes a priority. So, so I think for me, that kind of the landscape is about seeing across all the different schools where there are parallels and where there aren't. And I suppose because it's just a pet peeve of mine at the moment, the one parallel is newsflash. They've all been open subject to what you might have heard in the news. They've all been open. They've all been supporting key workers and vulnerable children. The staff have all been putting in a shift. The ones I've worried in many ways most about have been the senior leadership team because they've been working through any of their weekends, short holidays. They've been the ones because of shortages on staff covering lunch duties and all sorts, along with the rest of the team. Um, and I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether we're talking education or or the net support team from a business perspective. You know, lots of these things come down to just how you treat people, morale, respect and all the rest of it. Uh, and I think um, when it's a short sprint, you can knuckle down, you focus on the finish line and you, you find the energy to do what you need to do and, and never more so in education when you're worried about young people. When there's a there's no finish line in sight and it's just keep going for as long as you can and at times the narrative doesn't really reflect an appreciation of what's being done, um, I think that's really, really um, difficult. Uh, I'd also just, as part of that, you know, we often have conversations about the pressures in schools and the teachers you know, it's not just teachers in schools, and I wish the narrative would perhaps change to be the team in schools, the staff in schools, the TAs, the support, you know, the support framework that sits there operationally that are all there, you know, and if I wear my um, my slight nod towards the techie world, you know, the, the IT managers and, and IT technicians, they've had a hell of a job adapting and delivering on some of these last minute ideas. Um, so it's been a real mixed bag, but what I have seen consistently has been a real tour de force in terms of teamwork and collaboration in schools. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's, it's ironic, isn't it, that you suddenly put these barriers to physical interaction in place and many schools reported greater communication and collaboration between staff because often they'd walk in the door, head to their classroom or their area, and they'd be off and away working on things. And tools, whether it's Meet or Teams or whatever the, the, the platform is, has provided a framework where for some there's been an opportunity for greater collaboration. Um, and I think that that sense of, um, for me, I always have, I, I call it a luxury. There's a real one singular separation between the commercial world and education. And, and in the commercial world, whenever we do something really cool or we figure out something that gives us an advantage, it's our secret. We keep it under wraps because it's our competitive advantage. And in education, the default is to share it with your peers, give the benefit to others as well. And I think in a situation like this where you're under pressure and, and all the chips are down, I think that sharing mentality has really come to the fore in, in, in recent weeks, months, years, however long it's been. It's, it feels like it's been about five years. But yeah, so I, I guess that's a synopsis of, 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 sort of the very high level bits. I'm sure we can we can perhaps drill down on some of the strands within that. It's in, I'm going to pick up on that last bit, Al, if you don't mind. And I think it's really interesting. Do you think whether it's a correlation or, or, or a causal effect of no exams and no league tables as give people more of a sense of freedom to open up their doors and be more a actively sharing because they don't feel that education is competitive because they don't have to feel they're winning and actually the win is to support all learners, especially with the turmoil that we're going through and the focus on the disadvantaged and the learners rather than the winning I think there's an element of that. I mean, I suppose, you know, and I've declared declared my role. You know, one thing that I don't sit here is in saying, well, look, I'm, I'm an education professional that was, was taught to be a teacher. Uh, and I have absolute, you know, respect and regard for those that do. But I don't think it can it changes your perception, that, certainly that I see. But I'm not sure most people who are in the education profession at any level or stage within the organisation do it fundamentally because it's about what grades individuals get. It's more about seeing young people develop and grow and get opportunities. Now, I know the two are fundamentally linked in many regards, like it or not, 
But first and foremost, it's about seeing kids happy and safe and engaged. And that often trumps the, the um, you know, the view in terms of, of, of how we're going to assess it and, and put a, a label on it at the end. Uh, it might be a little bit of confirmation bias because you, you see the things that you've, you've been thinking about and you look for that validation. But for many, it's been months now we've been saying, surely with what's coming up and what the, the landscape's looking like, we can't be having um, exams at the end of the year. And already now we've seen Wales shift position, Scotland shift position. We're going to get, again, that inequity of outcomes. And, and so as soon as it seems obvious that as soon as you say, look, let's move to centre assessed grades again, firstly, you give teachers time to get and build the evidence. Uh, you know, and secondly, yes, there is an element of your release pressure because, you know, we could go down a rabbit hole here, and I apologise because I'm I'm often guilty of it. You know, there's a mindset that says actually, you know, who is best to assess a young person's performance and progress? Is it the person that sees them in the classroom two, three, four times a week and continually monitors their progress and what they have a grip of, or is it the person that sees that two or four hour snapshot of what they've managed to assimilate on a sheet of paper? You know, and that's a whole different topic I get, but I still think it comes back full circle to, you know. Were our CAGs last year, they were they were better results, but were they more reflective as opposed to simply being better? Um, and I do think staff have got so many different mandates and messages. You know, even in the last 24 hours, we've, we've flipped now to, if you haven't got a device, well, you can head off back into school again. And, and somehow schools have managed to supposed to adapt to all these different challenges. And pressure is, without a doubt, you know, never a positive thing in terms of, allowing staff to be fluid and deliver and so i think announcing that we're going to go back to the system we used last year at least there's clarity and the one thing that's been lacking in most aspects within the education world certainly the last nine to twelve months has been clarity because we've always been waiting for the well it's going to be half two terms shortly so we're bound to get another set of updates come through on friday afternoon or it's friday night we're going to get some updates for monday morning and it's always the same in any enterprise. I'd say it's the same in, in, in business. It's not just about the education space. If you have consistency and clarity on where you need to go, you can plan. If you're simply working to react to the next announcement, you're never going to get the same quality output. No business can work simply on a last minute dot com approach. No, I, I totally agree. And I think there was, there's an impl implicit element there around um, trusting teachers. Um, we we I, I often hark back to um, one of the podcast one of my, one, probably one of my favourite podcasts of all time, which is um, with Lord Jim Knight when he talked about that idea about trusting teachers as professionals, and that that phrase came out of um, the education secretary's mouth this 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 um, this last week, which which blew my mind um, that we would potentially be trusted. But it's that idea, I think, as much as anything else, that there's um, there is the teachers. What I've found in my experience, or in my, it might be limited, but in a lot of my experience, is that teachers don't want to give away grades for free. They don't want to say, you're, 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 I'm going to give five A stars to this group. They don't want to do it because they don't want to undervalue their subject. They certainly don't want to undervalue their, their profession. So we, they can be trusted and be professional. But we just we just got to, if we move away from that, like, I know we've talked about before, about that competitive element and that marketization of education, that it's about league tables, it's about Ofsted grades, it's about um, how, what percentage of value added you get in. If we move away from that, then maybe, just maybe, we'll get, we'll get an education system that supports all learners and, the, and the teachers that really want to be where they are rather than wanting to leave the profession. I think we've got two strands there. We've got one, which is, uh, when, when the phrase comes out about trusting teachers, in the same way as we trust the doctor to, to take an assessment of us in a physical sense, um, because of what's happened in the last 12 months, it's always about do you actually believe what they're saying? Do you do, do you actually have enough substance and trust in them when they're saying to actually appreciate the statement? Um, but absolutely, you're right. It, it's fundamentally key. You know, and, and the bit for me, which has always been a bit of a sore spot, you know, I get wearing my role from a, you know, a trust and a governance perspective, you know, you need to have data to better challenge. Are we doing the best for these young people? And everybody in every walk of life has got to have some level of challenge. But it always really smacks with me, and we didn't have it last year, to say, you know what, little Billy, you've worked your socks off. You've got enough for a, a level four on this one. But unfortunately, because loads of other kids around the country did, you're going to get a level three. You know, and that's kind of that, that percentile approach that 
I think is, is, is always the bit that doesn't quite sit right for me. It's kind of like if, you, if you've learned enough to reach the required standard, it shouldn't matter how many other young people around the country have done that. Um, you know, but, but I think it is a, it's, it's a challenge now because we're all second guessing, aren't we? But, you know, the sooner we get to the position where we're clear for each for the year on where we sit so that schools can plan, expectations don't change on a daily or weekly basis, it will help. But it's not going to change the fact that some of the things that have been set out as expectations for schools are still in many cases far from realistic. You know, whether that's the, the delivery of testing without considering the different types of schools, whether they're rural or city based and, and where they can pull resources from or the difference in the school estates, the different types of buildings that you allow you to, to split your classes, create bubbles and all the other bits and pieces that you need to do, you know, or, or whether it's simply a case of, you know, Small schools, particularly small rural primaries, are much more vulnerable to staff absences affecting the ability for a school to open and stay open safely. Certainly more so than, you know, it's the economies of scale model with staff rather than those other aspects. You know, and then, you know, it's not an, an unfrequent topic. We've already mentioned it. I'm sure we'll talk more about it. You know, the expectation of, well, if the children's at home, this is what you must do. Well, shall we start with uh, who the children are? you know what what their age group is what their expectations are and and also be realistic about what subjects and what staff it is because to suggest that everything can be delivered in the same way you know we get into the whole debate are we talking remote learning or are we talking remote teaching we want learning but which bit is it and actually you know i see this kind of narrative from parents it's become a competitive expectation again from the 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 well-intentioned but non-professionals. You know, well, I hear my my little friend at his school up the road, they sign in at 8.30 and they've got the full school day. Oh, I'm not getting that. And then you have to kind of say, but actually, is that good? Really? Do we want to be signed up and being talked at and presented at and shared at for seven hours straight? Does that fit for every kind of child and all the rest of it? And so I think there's a lot of this bit, which is, it was at the very beginning, I remember having conversations back in March and April, and, and it was probably a steer. It wasn't my um, my words of wisdom as much as feedback from the UAE, where they were ahead of the curve in terms of their provision, particularly in the international schools. And of course, they were lucky because they've got more equipment and technology to deliver that. But the most important lesson they kind of put in place was that exact phrase, trust the teachers. Every teacher knows how best to teach their cohort of children in each class. And to be prescriptive and say it must be one approach for all just doesn't work. So different groups of kids will need a different kind of blend. And I think that we are all coming back to the same thing, which is trust the professionals. If you trust the doctors to diagnose your symptoms and make you better, why not just trust the teachers to know how your children best learn and develop and let them get on with it? You know, and you'd have thought after the summer and before that parents would have realized this teaching lark isn't as easy as it might seem, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying that a lot as well. Al, the the fact that it, it seems to be the the gold standard to want to, to want to follow the timetable, um, just like you would in in in, a, in the in the physical reality of coming into school, and um and I wonder if it's kind of like that the whole uh, there's a lot of mantras in education at the moment like uh, like every minute counts things like uh, this this phrase thinking hard, and I, I read a blog the other day which uh, I, I'm trying to remember who wrote it. I can't remember, so I can't reference them. But they, it was a great blog about how actually. The human brain isn't supposed to, for a length of time, be thinking hard. The whole purpose, and one of one of the one of the kind of remits of of the brain, is to is to make sure you're not thinking hard all the time. So to put things into routine and things like that. And actually, um, and I, I think I was talking to Steve about this the other day, and how actually this could, what damage could that be doing in the long term in terms of wanting that 100% attention, that 100% thinking, that every minute counts um, constantly all of the time. And I think when you then transfer that over to online where the, where the kids are looking at a screen and that's being demanded of them, I think we're in quite dangerous territory there. And I don't know about you, but if I've done two or three um, Zoom meetings a, in a day, that, that's whacked me. That I, I'm ready to go and have a beer and sit in front of the TV for an hour. Uh, so to to demand that, but then also demand that they be active participants, where they're thinking hard constantly in that time. I think I think we we're, we're doing them, and, and like you said, I'm just resonating it really that we're doing them a disservice. I think there's a, there's definitely a contradiction here. I mean, I certainly agree about all day doing Zoom meetings. It would cost me a fortune in hair and makeup anyway, so I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> um, but lots of lots of the guidance that you hear in different approaches 
it's all about context. And so if you just take them all in singular value, they can be sound quite contradictory. You know, in one sense, we talk about the best way to distill information is to chunk it, to break it up into bite-sized chunks, let let people absorb that information and then use the information to help embed it and, and, and the, the process. And then at the same time, we're saying, no, no, you, you stay within this zone. But again, I come back to that earlier point. Well, I'm sorry, but if it's our young learners that have struggled in a mainstream provision, how are you expecting them to sit in that focused approach throughout the day. If you've got a young people who are used to having a TA sat next to them, helping and guiding them, how are we, how are we going to deliver that? Um, and actually, fly on the wall, and you guys are far more qualified than me, you know, in a lesson, it's not many lessons where it's the teacher delivering for the full 40 minutes or an hour. It's about sharing and directing and letting them go off and do something. And then it's that kind of feedback loop that then builds around that. So again, I think that the problem is, and, and I hate to be, because I don't know the answer for sure, but but the assumption to me is maybe that these, these kind of guidelines are best intentioned. They're tried to be as broad as possible to give a perception that will be um, perceived as being the right thing to try and do but I'm not sure that they've necessarily been shaped consultatively enough to recognize that actually that, that measure of what might be deemed as best practice for a lesson doesn't automatically mean that you multiply it by five or six each day and that yeah. equally becomes best practice. Uh, and I think as well, it's, it's a view in, it's almost a view of the online as second best rather than as other, as something different. And if you view it as second best, you're gonna try and squeeze as much out of it as you can so that it reflects the best position more um, whereas if you view it as actually something quite different and that can actually give us um, give us something different in terms of learning um, which seems to be the more healthier approach uh, in my view and I th probably all of our views that actually there are other things you can do rather than just replicate what's going on in the room and try to squeeze out from the sec this second best way of doing things yeah. uh, the most of what we can. <clears throat> it's almost like that. Um, and I'm, I'm just jumping in quickly. Do you know, we talked about that SAMA model that we that we talk about quite a lot, that substitution. It's as if you're talking about what you're talking about there is don't just replace, substitute what you would do in a classroom and try and put it online. I, what can we do that's, that's redefined and modified that changed the, what you would be able to do that you couldn't do in a classroom? And how does technology do that? And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw my and, that, and that's an interesting one, Ben, because, you know, that SAMA model, sometimes people see it as it's a, it's a scoreboard. You've got to be at the top. You've got to get right the way up to that modification and redefinition. It, it's not. And I think, again, this is element of we're putting expectation and pressure on teachers with different levels of competence in terms of the use of technology and trying to deliver different types of content. And this kind of expectation that the only gold standard and the tick in the box you'll get is if somehow you redefine the way you do learning. I mean, it's fantastic and it's aspirational in lots of regards, but there's also plenty of times where teaching doesn't require technology. And so this kind of disconnect is never going to add value. It's going to produce value. And it's about finding different ways to, to get the most and mitigate that, that, that disconnect that you have in place. Yeah, I think, we, we mentioned it earlier, actually, us three, when we talked about um, some information that came out from the Education Endowment Foundation in regards to what does good online learning look like. The difference, really, if Bob Harris was sitting here, it, it, when we talk about remote learning and everything else, it's like remote learning, teach online teaching. But actually, what does what does online learning and what does quality look like? The importance of that process. Um, and And going through all of that, and I think that the, what you deliver, how you deliver, how you go through a focus, um, how you assess feedback, you know, don't just stand there and deliver. You know, so that there is no difference from the research in terms of whether you deliver synchronously or asynchronous, whether they're all doing it, they're all there, or whether they're all doing it their own time. There's no difference in that. It's around how you assess the timeliness of feedback and, and the robustness of it. And also something that we're missing massively is that connection in terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, that if the teacher is just delivering live, what about that group work activity? But also the thing that we probably missed and students missed and were telling people during the first lockdown was, I really miss going and just socialising with my friends. And actually, yeah. if you're constantly on Zoom calls delivering maths, English, science, hour after hour, then not getting that bit to actually just come on for 15 minutes at the beginning of the day and just maybe connect and share and just have a conversation 
because that's think, all they're getting. And I think there's so much about that that we really need to think about. I think you're right, Stephen. I think the thing that when, when you sit one step removed and you plan something, the thing that you can never really allow for, which is the real shaper for most schools, <clears throat> ultimately is about capacity. If, if you're delivering learning in school for your um, key workers and your vulnerable children, and you're trying to deliver some form of provision online, and I try and separate the remote teaching to the remote learning, mainly to avoid Mr. Harrison sending me emails and telling me off. Um, there is a, there's a fundamental thing here, which is there's a capacity that you can't be in all places at all things and planning and prepping for all those bits and pieces. And actually, quality shouldn't be about how much of one thing you get. That whole discussion, which there's been plenty of people far smarter than me have shared their views on in terms of finding that blend, that mix between the two. And actually, there's some really good practice in just recording 15-minute exemplars that not only benefit your, your students, but benefit your colleagues, give them confidence, give them capacity and resource. That sense that actually there are some ways you deliver that can benefit other teachers. That benefits capacity so that you, you get, and it is about a balance. You know, it's like in every school, you can't have every teacher who's got 20 years teaching under their belt. You couldn't afford them all at the same time. You find a blend, don't you, between people at different stages. And I think within that whatever form of teaching and learning you're delivering it's about finding that blend that's why we have steve on the podcast he's he's like the um the nqt that we can afford to keep. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, i think i think the that that phrase around uh, and we we laughed about bob um always tells us the difference between uh online teaching and online learning and and i, and I, and I wonder whether like what that what that what that means and what we maybe what you've been seeing. I don't know if you've got any examples from some of the trusts you've been involved with, or so even even I know you you got connections all around the world of things that are working, whether they are uh, it doesn't have to be big. But you've talked about a couple of things there. I don't know if it's worth mentioning a couple more. Well, I think it's um it's an interesting one because you know when we when we first started talking about remote teaching and learning, let's use the two words in the same sentence, then we're covering all bases and we'll get, we'll avoid any issues. You know, the first thing was, how do you know if it's working? What, what are we using as the measure of impact? And how are we actually gonna assess that to actually say whether it's working? And of course, the first level is, you come back to, well, you trust the professional, the teacher knows whether you're getting engagement and what kind of work is being sent back in that you start to, to moderate on. It gets much harder at, primary and early years, particularly in key stage one, because so much of your measure is observational. You look assigning against the frameworks and you're looking how kids are doing. So the things that we've seen in terms of what's working well, well, the first and foremost, there's a kind of, to me, there's a bit of a line. The schools that tried to do perhaps the opposite that of my, of what has been presented for many is those that tried to keep it simple, often were most successful didn't set the prescriptive one-time ex expectation, but said, try and do what you can do as best you can, depending on the cohort you've got. Don't try and introduce, and this is a tough one for somebody that develops technology for schools, don't try and introduce too many new things at once because you create more pressure and challenge and uncertainty. And this comes back to that whole confidence side, you know, from a teaching point of view about acquiring new technology. The second measure of them that was about success was about actually how much schools were able to use the different delivery mechanisms actually ironically for parental engagement because that linked heavily into student engagement obviously as the children get older that becomes less of a of a factor but in terms of that connectivity and whatever platform you've been using whether you're microsoft google or or something else you know you there are the, the ability to measure the level of engagement young people actually accessing the work looking at it coming back on and so that was an element of of seeing what worked well and definitely the things that have worked well have been where schools have, have been proactive in, in engaging parents to be part of that learning journey uh, and that's been really successful you know there are some unexpected wins from it most of our team across the trust and beyond the idea with you know parents evening hell no we're doing them online from forever and a day now because they've been working much much better for many schools you know and it's probably again about blend but for lots of, of schools they're saying those hard to reach parents that didn't attend parents evening actually getting a five ten minute slot online in pre-recorded that's worked really well we can schedule that parents come in have the conversation many are more confident to share and engage in what's more of a private setting and in terms of balance of work-life balance for staff you haven't got parents evening that are just drifting and drifting and drifting 
Um, lots of schools have really developed their community engagement on a broader level. I know this is slightly on the periphery of our core question, but actually, if you think, and again, I, I know it's different by age groups, but lots of schools started off by saying, well, what do we know well or what can we do? So they started delivering daily stories on YouTube and on the school website, you know, ways to engage with younger learners, but to have that constant familiarity. And, and then when we got to May, June time, the questions that I think we did really well in our trust, and I'm sure many others did, was the concerns about the year six, year seven transitions and move up days and about let's do virtual tours. This is where you're going to be going. And these are the people and the faces you're going to be seeing. Uh, you know, and if I put in terms of priority order, the most important ones have been the schools that have found, it comes back to your point, Ben, rather than fill that whole day just in the virtual classroom, but have found a balance of resource and capacity to make sure all of our SEN children and other vulnerable learners have had that regular face time with a teacher to talk and just reassure because they're the ones that have suffered most with that lack of structure and, and familiarity, you know, as well as we know other learners have struggled with the that whole peer relationship. And that comes into, do we have tools? Do we have activities that allow the young people to engage in different ways, not always just purely in a, a black and white learning environment? You know, and I, so I think this, my biggest takeaway is schools that have trusted most in their staff and not held the sword of Damocles over teachers' heads for by taking risks, so far by trying things, have been the ones that have done best. There, I'm sure there are plenty have done fantastically by trying to do a very prescriptive and all-encompassing solution, but many haven't been at a point where they can do that, and so they've ended up kind of setting themselves up for failure. You know, and I think one of these things is a bit of a reality check. You know, actually, if you if we get halfway towards what the expectation is, it's still a lot further forward than we were two months ago. So let's give ourselves some positivity about that and keep pushing on to the next level. Yeah, and I think just talking yeah, about... essential, isn't it? All right, Steve. Oh, is there a lag? I don't know if there's a lag on my end or your end, but... Uh... All right. Uh, I think you're both the laggers. you massive laggers, both of <laughs> you massive laggers. I, I was just going to say around... Um, it does beg the question in terms of quality that it's, I think with, there's a lot of scrutiny, isn't there, in terms of online delivery because it's right in the forefront and everybody can see it. Parents can see what's going on. But actually, some of the quality potentially of what's been going on actually has, has not been up to, to standard as it is anyway. And I think I don't want to unpick that, but I think it's only because people can actually see it and they're sat right next to their their son or their, their daughter or whoever they're responsible for that actually then now are asking that question because they're at home. But I think my whole focus and, and, and everything I do and everything I believe in is around quality improvement, really. I think quality assurance is, is great, but I think that real trust, um, allowing people to take risks, but that freedom of of trying new things and, and, and really giving it a good go because everybody's trying their best. There is no teacher out there that is, is that might not be delivering the best education at the minute, but they are trying their damnedest to do so. And I think we just need to trust, give them the freedom, and at some point, yeah, it, it's totally appropriate that we need to call you sure and, and tell them if things that need to be improved, but actually show them and give them the tools and the support to actually then allow them to develop rather than just criticising and saying you're not doing it right. And I think that's what we need to really consider, definitely. Uh I think you're, you're, you're right on the money with that, Steve. But of course, the irony is when we're talking about this online delivery mechanism, actually, we've got, we're in a much better place to provide support and feedback and, and examples and exemplars in many ways than we were in the physical classroom. You know, we don't want to have too much in terms of the, you know, the, the classroom observations becoming too much of a, of, of a routine fixture and fitting because, you know, we, we all appreciate the pressure and challenges that puts it, that puts teachers under. But actually, one of the nicest things is there's, there's a wealth of, of recorded classes and lessons and exemplars within a trust that actually provides access for teachers to go and look at other practitioners' lesson delivery, come up with ideas, and, and that sharing and that resource does build confidence, you know. But if, but if, if you're not used to using, and for many people, the word Zoom and Teams and, and Meet were, was, was, was a new concept back in March. And if you're not used to doing it, then to turn around and say, well, actually, you started off by doing just yourself to camera and recording it to share with your students, to build confidence before you dive into a live lesson. You know, I think we have to take that 
reality check, which is it's still one step better than just sending out a document. It's at least a stepping stone towards providing some actual course. And actually, sometimes, why not do exemplars? At least because we're talking about, you know, some of the challenges right now, a lot of our learners are in households where there's, there's multiple kids and not multiple devices. So they're not all accessing live or able to. So having content they can access at different times of the day, you know, I think is really important. You know, in the same way as schools are expected to figure this all out now, we've had six months to sort it out, it's fine. If we flip the conversation to, well, you've had six months to sort out delivering all the devices that we need for our um, for our vulnerable learners, the conversation goes a bit quieter, doesn't it? It's not quite as straightforward as that. And in the meantime, that hasn't been six months where you can all sit on your backsides and, and learn. Schools have still been open, teaching still being delivered. And so there hasn't actually been that much time. Lots of schools, on, you know, regrettably, because of pressures, have been relying on those, those valuable and, and few and far between inset days to try and embed that kind of confidence, you know, at the back end of last term, the start of this term. But we all know when it comes to technology use, and, and this isn't about education, it's the same in every um, workplace, you know, it's about repetition, familiarity. The more you use the technology, the more you build confidence. And in many ways, we've kind of gone from using it to a certain degree first time round to having a term of, it's not been normal because of all the other restrictions, but normality on the whole in terms of delivery of teaching and learning back in the classroom to then flipping back the other way again. And, and that's much, much tougher to suddenly completely change the delivery model all over again. I know one thing that you did do Al, at the, uh, a few weeks into the, the first lockdown was um, was your kind of revised digital st strategy um that you that you put out there uh could you would you maybe just give us a bit of an insight that because i think that's probably it, it it's irrelevant now it's, isn't it as well and, and i think a lot of a lot of teachers would benefit from from having a look at that now yes i mean it's it's a it's a, it's a document that um mark anderson and i wrote together I, I mean originally we set out to write it back in um 99 with a view to uh, we launched it at, at bet um for Bet that's a show that used to happen, by the way. <laughs> um, and um, a very much a digital strategy guide, you know, without going through the full full gamut, that concept of how does a school set about deciding on its digital journey and planning for it, and very much that, you know, encompassing all stakeholders, making sure that all the voices are there, and really setting that expectation for where you want to end up in a number of years from now, so that as you incrementally start investing in technology and solutions and the way you do things, you've got a sense of where you're ending up. And often, you know, it's the anecdotal. Lots of the time, schools end up with a, a, an announcement of an available budget each year, and it's not necessarily done in a, a pre-planned way. Now, now that work was done, and um, it was amazing. We, we had 3,000 copies printed for BET, and they were all gone after about a day and a half, and we've sent probably another 10,000 out digitally. And it's been a really, really popular document but of course um benefit of hindsight one of the strands we didn't build in there we talked about obviously start from a teaching perspective a student's perspective from an SEM perspective from a data protection perspective safeguarding finance the IT manager bringing them all together in that magic Venn diagram we didn't have a, a dedicated section about remote teaching and learning and an online practice because that wasn't really on the radar um, and lo and behold it did. So we kind of said, well, look, we need to reflect and we need to bring that in. And and the kinds of questions being asked, you know, and I, I talked about the, the the mindset of educators and sharing, you know, um, I'm very lucky. I've got a really, really good PLN on Twitter that you can very quickly see not only the kinds of things that people are, are uncomfortable with or looking for support or resources for, as well as you can learn quickly from the from the things that, you, that that are presented there so so looking at that one of the key things was obviously people were looking for a bit of a kind of a guidance in terms of give us some ideas in terms of best practice whether it's best practice in terms of um, how to lead uh, you know and an, an a, a synchronous lesson um, and the things to think about some of the basics like you know best practice for um, guidance for your kids their checklist of what to do when they're on camera in a virtual lesson etiquette respect behavior uh, ties into digital citizenship and that broader sense. Um, reminders in terms of what the key strands are in terms of scaffolding and signposting and trying to build a feedback loop in a lesson. You know, and of course, as we do, Mark and I, in many ways, from that point of view, take our own experiences and then Magpie from other people who've been sharing really useful resources and bring it together. And so we kind of added two extra sections to say, well, look, here's some ideas. But then we thought, well, actually, let's go a step further. 
and we've kind of interlaced through all the different sections from each department or, or stakeholders perspective case studies from people that have been there done that been out there what's worked well for them and um, let's be honest we, we all learn by referring to peers we trust and saying well you know tell us about the things you you tripped over on and tell us about the things that work really well so it's become a revised version that's just got lots of tips and advice and checklists of things to ask checklists to consider and these things interweave because now with the, the most recent guidance on expectations in terms of remote teaching and learning that filters through to slt and governance in terms of the questions you should be asking are we meeting these demands do we have the function of the tools? Do we have the training? You know, lots of schools now from a finance point of view need to rethink the mindset when it comes to professional development, CPD, and the budgets that are assigned for that. And that we're now realizing that if you go out and spend tens of thousands of pounds on technology and put 500 pounds in the budget for CPD, you're gonna get found out and you're gonna set an unreasonable expectation on the users. So all those kind of things is really just trying to signpost it. And, and like all things, we've shared it. We've had lots of really positive feedback. And we've also had ideas for extra things to add. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be a version three. But, you know, very much it's it's something you can you can access from free. If you, you'll you see it's listed on my Twitter feed or you can head across to the NetSport software website and there's a free download there. Um, it's meant to be a, a sharing resource. It's also got a lot of list of different products and and associations you can connect with as well are lots of people who are online that are good people to follow if you want to get some tips and ideas you know and hopefully uh, it's something that people are really valuing yeah it, i just want to pick on something you said there like fast forward a year hope, hopefully a year when when uh we've been vaccinated the covid's no longer a threat everyone's uh back in back in school uh, uh normal normal uh hopefully, hopefully it'll be like that in a year's time uh in and we've invested, so we, we'll have schools up and down the country, colleges invested in the technology, invested in some of these in some of the skills. Do do you think do you see that being used then, or do you see it kind of just kind of going back towards like a, well, it's an optional extra? How do you how do you see the yeah. landscape in the future? I'm going to try and be positive here, Dan. I promise, <laughs> I promise I'm going to be positive. I, I mean, there's a number of strands here, which is. There's a, there's a bigger question to facilitate that decision, which is irrespective of what may or may ha not happen with the pandemic and subsequent it iterations of it, if we want to have that insurance policy to get the most out of it, there's going to have to be broader national decisions about infrastructure and connectivity at homes for young people. And there's going to have to be a revisit to funding and finance towards schools, because what we don't want to do Post BSF, we saw the same thing. We have lots of funding, great buildings, and then there was no cash in the pot to renew things. So things kind of withered on the vine a little bit. If we roll forward to schools now and we think, what about in the next 12 months? I suppose the truth is that's down to staff and leadership as much as anything else. I think many who've seen the successes and benefits um, will, will adapt elements that have worked well and will interweave that in future school life. If we think there's no pandemic, there's no need to ever be outside the school building, and they'll recognize that there is a blend for when we do parents' evening. There is now that question, one that I asked in school early on, which is when we get to the Easter holidays in a year's time, when we're having exams again, rather than staff giving up their time and coming into school to do revision classes, maybe we'll use what we've learned now and do them online so that not only does it save some travel time, but that revision class will be accessible to those learners that couldn't join that session. You know, that those are really simple things. Maybe we'll realize that some of the tools we've got, we might change our focus, the same tools, but in different ways. And instead of focusing on how effectively can we deliver online learning, we'll say, how effectively can we use these tools to benefit work balance and time efficiency within the school and the classroom so that this ever increasing curve of what we have as expectation on, on staff can somehow be mitigated by the appropriate use of technology. So, so I, Al, are you saying there's going to be no more snow days? Is that is that what you're trying to say? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm a big fan <laughs> of snow days. I said, it's actually funny enough, it's a conversation I had with one of our primaries and I kind of said, we can use them instead of snow days. And the answer is <laughs> not not to spend the, have the kids learning for the day, but yeah. maybe to connect first thing in the morning, reassure and set them some project work to go and do out in the snow. Go and explore, have fun, find out the difference about things for our younger learners. The truth is it's always about you know, adaptability and how we use those, use technology. You know, and so I think it will, it, it, I hope it will certainly shape things, but it does come back to this narrative, which, you know, I, I won't claim to be the, the originator or the owner of this narrative, but it's a really interesting question, I think, which is, you know, 
do we go out and say, let's find a tool that fits what we want to do in the classroom or what we're doing in the classroom right now? Or do we flip it on its head and say, do we go out and see what kind of technology and innovations out there and that potentially adapts and shapes the way we do things in the classroom? Which is leading which? Now, the truth is, you know, nobody wants and there's nobody's ever going to be, frankly, in education in a position where you can just go out and buy loads of different things and give it a try. The budgets don't exist and you're spending public money, so nor should it in that regard. Um, but what I think it has sparked, and I may be slightly biased on this one, but what I has sparked um, both in schools but also in the sector is a real revisiting of two things. One, innovation, because innovation has been a little bit paused i would say in the sector in recent years and, and i say that respectfully because of course there are some great new products always coming through but if you if you look at the major trade events often it doesn't always feel like there's too much that's fresh and new um and and a lot of the edtech space have had to really revisit and readapt and, and i think many have done a fantastic job much like the schools have but what it's also done i think is it's brought the edtech and the education community closer together and so what I'm hoping is we'll also see a lot more co-production, a lot more, these are our needs, let's adapt, let's try different things that can work better and kind of bring that connectivity together. That is probably me rambling a bit from the original question, which is I think schools will use tech more effectively for comms and timekeeping and other things. They probably won't in all schools use it as effectively as they could because there'll be another challenge and another pressure in a different area next year. But hopefully, if there's the long-term funding and support for it, it will become embedded in, in many ways. Yeah, um, I, I love that. And I love the idea that you, what you're trying to do is is, is make, the, I don't know, um, a good friend, Dave Leonard, on, you've been on the Learning Dust podcast talking about techies and teachers working together um, and about the tech working with the teachers and the teachers working with the tech. It shouldn't, they shouldn't be separate things should be and um uh, the, or they shouldn't be silos in, in in that sense and i wonder i wonder whether on that um whether it requires and this isn't this isn't blowing smoke anywhere at all um that it requires people who have maybe got a little bit of your mindset out which has been you've, you've always championed that I, I i put something on twitter earlier and I, I don't i don't mean that i didn't say that um lightly either is that you've always been a kind of person that's seen like a little glimmer of hope and or a little glimmer in people and try to to, to champion that um and i know that there's lots of people in the edtech world that would 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 kind of make testament to that one of them who's actually working with you now we've just joined working with you hasn't he mike anderson started working at net support absolutely who who, who who and maybe it's, it's that kind of mentality that the 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 companies that are working with education and the people maybe not just at the head of those uh, those organizations but it's that have a kind of wanting to work together and it comes from that heart of 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 caring and collaboration there is a symbiosis first and foremost between you know the educators and the products and if you don't have that connectivity then you're never going to get good products that and again that's the same in every sector and and if you're looking at any kind of you know, approach of how you work most effectively, whether it's within the workplace or between different entities, that kind of symbiosis exists. I think the the really special thing with education, and it's why for me it's such a kind of a passion and I give up a lot of my time to try and support, is I think it's that kind of sharing nurture. In the same mindset that you want to give a young person the best chance to shine, whether that measure is in any of their skills, academic, creative or whatever, then I think the same applies in business. You know, there's lots of people I, I meet and I'm very fortunate to meet within the education space who've got great ideas, passionate, just need a voice, just need a bit of a leg up. And the truth is it costs me nothing but time. Sometimes it costs me a little bit to support, but you know, in reality, it's about time, giving people a platform. Um, and I, I'm always say, I, I often, you know, reference the fact that at BET, we tend to have as much of our stand dedicated to give a space for teachers to come and present or IT managers as we do product. You know, it's not all one way. I'm always learning. I'm always listening. You hear people. And actually, if you want to have keep grounded and keep an ear to a sector, you can't sell into a sector. That's that's what some vendors choose to do. The reality is you have to you have to put in as much as you want to take out. You have to be part of the sector, give up your time and energy. That's the only way you learn. And our products are better for our relationships by, you know, without a doubt. Um, than they would be if we just kind of took a distance view. You know, personally, 
I, I won't claim to be a frustrated teacher because I certainly don't have the patience and tenacity for that. But I, I see so many opportunities in education. Often it, it diplomatically it frustrates me because I think it's untapped opportunity. And like everything, you kind of take your experience from the commercial world and you and you look at how that could be applied in education. And people tend to get nervous when you say that because it's like school's not a business. And it's like, well, no, it's not. It's not a business. But actually, if you effectively run a multi-academy trust, a large map, and you run it like a business, what you do through economies of scale and operational efficiency and tools is you generate savings and you generate time. And then that saving and time is invested in where it matters, teaching and learning and resources for young people. And so there are there are parallels where it makes absolutely a lot of sense. You know, but um, I'm in a very fortunate position. I'm sure there are many who, like myself, want to provide support and, and aren't in the position where they necessarily have the, the resource and the time to do that. Um, but like I say, I get an opportunity to chat with all sorts of interesting people. And I'm the first to admit I'm on a lifelong learning journey, always picking up new bits of information that I can share. And we're all going to jump in at the same time. It always does that. We always do that. We all unmute at the same time and whatever. No, I think I think we we certainly appreciate that uh, and and see the value of what you do. I wonder if I wonder if it's worth. Um, I know classroom cloud has been something that you've been um, that you that that's that's re it's not it's, it's relatively. Is it one of your newest products? It is one of your newest products, isn't it? So it's six worth, nine months. Worth, yeah, yeah, yeah. Worth worth us let, maybe have a, having a conversation about what what you're seeing with that as we kind of draw to a close. A bit of a talk about what Netsport are doing there and around uh, around classroom cloud would be would be lovely. Happy to. Um, I'm not going to go into all, all the nuances. The reality check is we've just been talking for the last 45 minutes or whatever about the change in the landscape, about teaching and learning and the teaching environment. And in many ways, I think it's, you could argue it's about schools building that insurance policy in to how they deliver and the tools they use, depending on what may or may not be the landscape in the future. Um, and like most things, you develop a product to meet a need. And if you've developed it well and you've co-produced it, it fits a need at a time. And on that same measure, if we move the clock forward to now, the landscape has changed. So to try and suggest that our existing products, amazing that they are, would automatically fit the new requirement would be frankly dishonest. And so if we want to talk about a need to deliver um, some form of platform to, to deliver lightweight, easy teaching and learning, uh, we need to be able to use a tool that you can use both in the classroom and when the kids aren't in the classroom. Um, and again, that's about not having to overburden teachers and staff with learning multiple different solutions. Um, and we want to use the tools that we typically would use in the classroom, because I feel if you can't use those tools remotely, you're almost disadvantaging for a starting point. Uh, you kind of need to be willing to adapt. So we absolutely went into fast track mode, pulled all of our teams together, took what we've learned over the last 30 years with our desktop instructional technology across the platforms and said, how do we flip it to be in the cloud make it super easy to manage. So pull through all your Google Classroom or your school data sync data so your classes are pre-populated. And let's not worry about where the teacher is or where the child is. Just allow a teacher to start a class, connect to their children, um, and not only be able to engage with them, but at the same time see what's on their screens, shepherd and nurture. You know, the simple things that are the frustrations at the start of the lesson. You know, if I was chatting here now and I said, right, let's open this web page, I'd be sitting here waiting for you to do it, and then I'd be checking, have you done it now? Whereas what you actually want to do is just push it out so it launches on all their screens and be able to see their screens so you know it's there. Be able to do those quick surveys and quizzes just to gauge understanding, um, to be able to collaborate with them, let kids put their hand up in a virtual sense and ask for help. And, and all the little bits and pieces that we'd use in a typical ICT suite with the technology we have. Again, be sort of device agnostic and fluid. And so classroom.cloud is really taking all that we've learned over the last 30 years and saying, how do we make it? something that isn't scary to teachers, isn't an overhead for a school IT manager to implement and install, and gives that connectivity no matter where the kids are. And if you invest in one thing, you can use it both whether you're in school or not, or a fusion of the two. Um, and so that's been available um, over the last nine months, probably six to nine months. And it's been through an evolution. We've been adding features because co-production is very much my kind of mantra. So people are saying, this is great, Al, but, and don't they always? If you could just do that, it would be one click rather than two. And if you could just do that, we could nuance something else. So we're constantly shaping it and evolving it. And um, we've got a, 
a, big, a large number of schools um, across the Middle East. Uh, Abu Dhabi Education Council have got it. A lot of school districts across the US have gone with it as a simple solution. You know, and this isn't to replace other tools that are out there. It's about something that meets a need and is something that's a flexible tool in the toolbox that kind of does that connectivity, lets the kids collaborate together and, and so on. Um, and it's a platform for us that will evolve. Um, you know, as we'd expect, schools say, can we have it? And at the moment we're saying, knock yourself out, go and use it free for a month or two and let us know what you need to do. Um, and it will evolve because all our products do. And I think the best products are the ones that evolve and adapt based on what's happening in the landscape. Um, and I think as a business, it's something we like. You know, it's tough to be in the IT sector 30 years and, and not be willing to kind of adapt as you go along. So classroom.cloud for us has been, um, yeah, it's our most recent product. It's a big shake because Netsport School has been around 25 years. So it's, it's, it's mature is the good term. And it's full of all sorts of stuff. But I don't think right now there are any products that schools are adopting where the prize goes to who's got the most buttons on the toolbar or who's got the most complexity. It's actually just about ease of use and accessibility. How quickly can both sides of the connection be confident in using it? Um, so that's been our recent dev focus and something that I'm very proud of, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, I, I, I know that um, we're grateful for your time. I know you say you give a lot of time to the education sector. We're, we're grateful for the time that you give us and that you've given us this evening. Thanks uh, so much for joining us. Um, uh, best place to, to find you, obviously, on Twitter, Al Kingsley underscore edu. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, Absolutely. see, see, look, it's up there. And, um, and, um, check out the the stuff at net support software.com as well so uh, thanks so much for, for coming on al my pleasure good to see you all keep safe folks thanks al it's been great chat take care